Hi, Craig Wilson here. Thanks for listening in and welcome to the Making the Media podcast. The technology involved in news gathering and story creation is always evolving. Multi-skilling has seen greater demands placed on journalists, as has the advent of new platforms. Broadcast is, of course, now just one of a number of distribution channels where stories need to be shared, with many more viewers now consuming their news on mobile devices. And the use of mobile phones in the news gathering process is what we're focused on for this episode. Mobile journalism, or Mojo, as it is often referred to, has been around for a little while, and someone who has been a pioneer in that field is Glenn Mulcahy, who's our guest. Glenn worked at the Irish broadcaster RTE, and it was there around 15 years ago where he first began to see the potential of what the new generation of smartphones could bring to journalism. He went on to become RTE's head of innovation and founded two major mobile journalism conferences, RTE Mojo Con and then after he left RTE Mojo Fest, providing a forum for content creators to gather and share their views on the world of mobile journalism. A technology innovator, he's now working as a media trainer, passing on his skills to new generations of journalists. Now, in series one of the podcast, we looked at Mojo with Philip Bromwell, so check out the show notes for a link to that episode. This time round, we'll discuss the world of Mojo in depth, but before we get to that, I wanted to find out where Glenn's interest in this field began. And it starts just after he began a role as a manager in RTE's news technology team. When I took the role as a manager, basically, in the newsroom, I I had to manage the crews. And one of the very distasteful first jobs I had to do was to reduce the headcount of my staff. RT was going through one of the many financial contractions that it's done through over the years. And I was faced with this situation of trying to identify where there were opportunities to basically cut back on staff. And it was it was a it was a pretty unnerving thing to do, having come from a staff position to a management role to immediately then become the demon trying to get rid of someone. And actually, what I did is I pitched an idea to my boss at the time. who was very open to kind of new ways of working and technology, uh, which was uh, a growing movement. This was 2000, 99, 2000, a growing movement called video journalism. I'm sure you're intimately familiar with it. But back then it was still seen as relatively new. It kind of kicked off about five years earlier uh, in New York, allegedly anyway. Um, so I pitched this idea of how about rather than get rid of the crews who were actually kind of freelance contractors, what we do is we look at changing up our production model and try to introduce some video journalism as well. It would diversify our kind of news gathering reach and, you know, give us a chance to upskill the staff. The staff They're already editing at the desktop. How about we just tick the other box and show them how to shoot for themselves as well? So after much uh, fun and frolics, basically, with union negotiations and everything that lasted nearly two years, we appointed the first tranche of video journalists to both TG Car and the RT newsroom. And it was actually, ironically, someone who you've interviewed multiple times, I think, at this stage, Philip Bromwell, a good friend and colleague of mine, um, Philip was actually appointed in that first tranche of video journalists that were brought into the RT newsroom. So t- small tie in there. Anyway, long story short, that was 2000. About five years later, RT decided that they wanted, rather than contracting in external trainers, they wanted me to basically upskill as a trainer. So they sent me over to the BBC Academy and I did a train the trainer program. And on the back of that, I started teaching people how to shoot and edit as video journalists. That role brought me to uh, Budapest. I think it was about 2007, 2008, where we were doing video journalism training. We had the usual, you know, it was Avid, as it was, actually Media Composer and laptops. And we had, uh, I think it was Z3 possible cameras, you know, VJ style cameras anyway. And I had just, my wife had just come back from the States and she had brought me back the first generation of the iPad. Already had an iPhone. And basically when all our students were out filming, I just, out of partial boredom, to be honest, uh, decided to shoot some content uh, with the phone. And I, I had... I'd used Filmic Pro actually as the camera app on that phone. It had just launched. And basically I cut it on what was then iMovie on the iPad and I sent it back to RT via FTP. Didn't say anything about how I made it and was amazed that it kind of slipped. I'll say slipped through the ingest workflow process. It did have to be transcoded, obviously, but nonetheless, it got through. And that really made me think, it's interesting. It could, you know, it could be something in this. The biggest challenge was how do you shoehorn in a consumer device into a broadcast production workflow? And basically, I'd say I spent the best part of the first three years of my kind of mobile journey trying to fix that, trying to figure out ways to turn progressive 30 frames per second, adaptive frame rates, all the amazing good stuff that we had in the early days of mobile into something that you could actually edit competently on, you know, desktop class professional editor. 
anyway, that was then. That, however, um, did bring me to doing a presentation at CIRCOM, which I think was 2011, showing the research that I'd done and the different apps that I'd found and the accessories that I'd found. And on the back of that, they commissioned me to the first Mojo course with four other trainers, actually, one from Croatia, Norway, and the UK. And we launched mobile journalism for CIRCOM. Now, I'm not saying other people weren't doing it, to be fair. There are others who are also in a very, very similar timeline. Uh, but that's where it all kind of kicked off for me. And from there, right up until when I left RTE, I was heavily, heavily immersed in the whole space of basically upskilling people to be able to both shoot, edit, and live stream from their phones. What do you think it brings that's different from going out and shooting something with a traditional broadcast camera? As someone who used to assign resources, I was always intimately aware of the fact that we had a bottleneck because we had limited amount of, of either camera crews or VJ cameras. So every single day, there were great stories that were hitting the editorial cutting room floor, so to speak, that never made the light of day. And I think the first major selling point for me was the fact that like the journalists wanted the smartphones anyway, irrespective of what they could do with them. They just, it was a you know, must have. And I kind of felt, well, this could done properly. This could massively extend our reach and really reinforce that idea of what our public service remit is. It would allow us to tell more regional, more um, localized, even stories, I would think. Now, I look back now on 11 or 12 years in the mobile space and wonder if I actually ever managed to achieve that, to be honest, because the downside of it is, is that most people look at mobile as a just a cheaper solution. They don't really necessarily look at uh, adapting the workflow in the way that they actually distribute storytelling. And that's, that's a missed opportunity. I go on about that quite a lot when I talk about Mojo in the bigger context of it. But there are other advantages. So during COVID and the phase that we've been through with lockdown and everything, one of the things that really brought mobile to the fore was we had to completely rethink how news was made. Most people were quarantined, working from home, might have had a work laptop, but they certainly didn't all have VJ cameras at home. And suddenly there was a need to be able to get talking heads on air at short notice to, in inverted commas, broadcast spec. Mobiles in many situations with many of the biggest broadcasters in the world were the solution that was relied upon to deliver that. It was actually rarely webcams and more so mobile. And um, so that was one of the first big kind of pivot points that that this time, rather than having to make an, uh, a conscious decision to adopt mobile, people were, to all intents and purposes, by virtue of the circumstance, forced to use mobile. And the thing that really, really tickled me somewhat was having fought the good fight for about seven, eight years at that stage. Suddenly there was this narrative on social media, people going, oh my God, could you look at this in front of a TV screen? Who knew? It looked like it was outside the White House. Um, and I was kind of going, yeah, it's been around for a while. But anyway, um, the other thing I would say genuinely, having looked at a, a huge repository of different stories with the different broadcasters I've had the privilege of working with, you get a different narrative. And this is something that I think is rarely spoken about, but it actually is, for me, it's super important because storytelling is changing the idea of the lean back linear narrative that we're so used to on television it doesn't really work at all when you move over into the lean forward kind of social storytelling space and i think more and more broadcasters are becoming more cognizant of this what mobile does in that context is it often gives you a very very um a very real a very visceral insight into people's lives because i've always been amused having gone on documentary shoots and everything when you have you know a crew with three or four point lights maybe a sound operator, a big ENG camera, the reporter, and sometimes even a producer milling in the background. And it kind of feels like the circus has come to town. For an average domestic person being interviewed on news, it literally is, where's the huge big truck? Because that's the only other thing I need, right? For all its advantages, you rock up with a mobile with a small microphone, simple little tripod, you end up doing an impromptu mojo class explaining the apps that you use and how you manage to get it on the television. This is the conversation that happens so often. But the thing about it is, is because it's, there's no, you know, it's not mystical, like everyone has one of these devices now, it actually, it almost blends into the background very, very quickly. And competent mobile journalists know that they can play that to their advantage. They know that they can set it aside, set up their interview shots, and then really do a deep dive with this person who, as often as not, is basically going to completely disregard that camera now and 100% engage with you. With the circus, there's a performance and there's a bit of a veneer and there's a little bit of holding back involved in an awful lot of cases. Now, that doesn't apply to professional spokespeople, obviously, but to Joe on the street, that really is a very visceral uh, outcome of it. So I think there have been a few opportunities. Some organizations have leveraged these really well. And I, I have to kind of name check RTE, not because I worked there for the best part of my career, but to give Philip and his team credit. They have pushed the boundaries on that idea of kind of social storytelling, looking at kind of uh, constructive news stories and really playing to the strengths of mobile. Because what I am not, Craig, 
even though I get accused of it regularly on social media. What I am not is the kind of uh, unlimited evangelist that says, get rid of your sat trucks and your ENG cameras and fire everybody because all you need is five mobile phones. That is not me at all. I'm a pragmatist. I share this vision with Philip, which is a kind of a mixed economy and choosing the right camera for the story is what every news organization should aspire to. And that doesn't just mean ENG to phone, because as you well know, sitting in the mid ground between both of those, there's mirrorless, there's large chip cameras, there's a whole suite of different tools that have different strengths and advantages and shortcomings, which are ideal for different types of aesthetic and different types of stories. So mobile definitely fits into that. And it, it for me, the sensible thing is to kind of take the pragmatic view, give them to everyone, train everyone how to use them, because news waits for no one. And the day that that big story lands on your lap, you'll have a member of your team who's going to be able to respond to it as a proper multimedia storyteller who can basically give you photographs for your website, video for the news, sound bites for the radio, and a rolling narrative on social. It covers all bases. Yeah, you, you mentioned there about seeing mobile as, as part of the kit of parts that you would have as, in your sort of toolbox, if, if you like. Do, do you think there's a sense that, I'm sure when you started, people would have looked at it and gone, you're going to do that for the for the TV with a with just a phone, and there's perhaps a snobbishness around it. Do you think that still exists, or do you think that's 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 lessening? It's a really interesting question. So I would, you know, I've I've actually traveled the world teaching different organizations how to get their staff to adopt mobile, and I definitely encounter what I would still refer to as the ivory tower syndrome in so many broadcasters. And um, one of the biggest arguments that we had in the very early days of adoption is no one will take us seriously. We're going to undermine the credibility of the brand if we turn up with just a phone. You know, we, that when we come up with the, you know, the fully branded ENG kit and everything else as well, they know who we are. But if I just rock up the phone, I'll just feel like a little localized reporter. The bizarre thing about it is uh, my business is pivoted. It's no longer media organizations. Now I train NGOs, businesses and governments. And when you see the governments in every country that have been in out with their social media teams, basically using mobiles to capture and amplify what the individual kind of um, politicians are doing, you kind of realize that the people that you really want to get in front of the camera that might be given the slagging for it not looking like a professional tool are, in fact, one of the early adopters for using it for its full strength. So um, I kind of feel that the snobbishness has, as a result of the whole adoption through the COVID phase, to some extent, fallen away. But there is still a legacy of it there. There's still a kind of a a sense that it's like the poor cousin that, you know, proper people use proper cameras. Um, whereas actually, personally, when I look back now over the 20 years in broadcast and everything, I would say that for the most part, we missed a, a golden opportunity to really reach into local and communities um, and not an awful lot of people. The BBC, I will give a name check to this because I know that they've done a massive adoption project over the last 12 months to roll out mobile into the regions there. And that is a brilliant example of, of where its true potential lies. But you know what? Look, as a former engineer looking at the technical side, in many ways, the latest generation of smartphones have surpassed broadcast specifications. I had this with an engineer only a couple of days ago. Again, they, they, there's some of the team that I fight with, and it is a fight. Like, it's in good spirits, but it is, you know, it's testy, are still kind of going, oh, you know, you still don't have Zoom. But it's like, that is true. But now we do have ProRes plus 4K plus, 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 plus. All the arguments we've been having for the last decade are gone. It's now producing content, which is technically actually better than most of the commissioning standards for most TV news organizations. And yet the one thing they will still all seize on is it can't zoom. And that's where I kind of quit back. You're right. It can't. And that's why you need the 60,000 euro ENG camera. You mentioned there about the capabilities of the camera. One question I wanted to ask about was, I always felt when I was doing stuff, that video in some respects was the straightforward part. Audio was the difficult part. So when you're doing training and things like that for on, on, on mobile journalism, how much of it is actually about getting the audio right? Because I, I always felt that was the trickiest bit. Yeah, 100%. And actually, I would say audio in many ways is the key differentiator between the consumer video content that you see and the pro content that ends up on TV. So every, you know, and I'm not going to call them a mobile journalist, every multimedia journalist who is worth their salt knows that no matter what camera they have in their hands, audio is every bit as important. And there's no question that in the early days of mobile, it was a case of soldering or hacking together cables to try and get an external mic plugged in. But again, we have long since passed that Rubicon. We're fast approaching two really interesting inflection points in the mobile space, which is the camera technology to a certain extent, I feel is kind of plateaued. Yes, a periscope lens to give us some extra level of zoom would be a huge advantage in the iOS side. But to be fair, if 
brands like Samsung, Sony, and others have actually had these periscope lenses for a couple of years now. So Zoom, not as much of a Rubicon as it was anymore, but the sound side, in many cases, were still limited to predominantly one or maybe two channels of audio. But I know for a fact, I won't name names, but I know for a fact that several of the manufacturers are working up to four channels of audio, which would instantly align us with an awful lot of the ENG cameras out there. Um, and I know that there's quite a few of the hardware manufacturers. It, there's a couple of devices already after launching. IK Multimedia only a few months ago launched an external mixer, which can be uh, sent into the phone via USB-C or via Lightning, which supports four tracks of audio. So there will be a little bit of catch up here, but I get this strong sense from the kind of the we'll say the um, the accessory community, that they're conscious that there's a huge opportunity with upping the game in relation to audio. Because, you know, then it, it appeals to people who want to do podcasts. It appeals to people who want to do more music production. You can have multiple devices coming in in parallel. Um, so that's coming. And then the other thing that I've heard a lot about, certainly since MojoFest last May, is uh, using AI for audio cleanup and post-production. One question I wanted to ask around, um, Glenn, is what are people doing when they're going? Are they... Are they shooting and uploading back and then editing on like something like Media Composer or are they shooting and editing on the device or is it a mixed economy of people doing both of those things? Yeah, so I think it is a mix. And I, I would say from experience, the vast majority of journalists are still offloading the content off the phone onto either a desktop or a laptop uh, to do the edit. That genuinely is my experience. When I do the training, I tend to try and open their mind to the opportunities that actually editing on the device, what, what it presents. So full disclosure, I've, I've been a, a brand ambassador unofficially for LumaTouch since they launched. To be fair, a couple of years ago, they asked me to come on board and be trained up by them as an official trainer, um, but still in a freelance capacity. But I, to be honest with you, I was actually using what is LumaFusion. It's, it's by far the best editor on both iOS and Android, but it is in fact uh, an alumni of Avid. The team that built it are actually all ex-Avid people, Terry and Chris. So um, I try to open journalists' mind to the possibilities of what they can just do on the device before they start to offload. And I'll give you one primary reason for that. I mentioned it earlier, this idea that in the news game in particular, you never know what's going to happen. I've had genuine case studies in my career where people that I've trained have actually had mobile phones taken off them after they've done the training, go figure, and then literally find themselves in the middle of some of the biggest news stories you can imagine. I want journalists to know how to basically do the full production workflow of shooting to broadcast standard, of editing to broadcast standard, doing the audio mix, and then being able to send a consolidated finished edit so it can go straight into the broadcast chain. For me, that is the ultimate aspiration. Why? When someone does not have a laptop with them locally and they're depending on trying to get someone else to edit that content for them back at the organization, we're immediately looking at a bottleneck. How good is the Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, 5G connection that they have to be able to get 15, 20 minutes of rushes back before this media can actually be aired? Um, there's different workflows, and I think I really try hard to make sure that everyone's implicitly aware of what they can do just on the device before they start to offload onto the main central newsroom systems. You mentioned earlier on that you've been fortunate enough to, you know, to travel and to, to, to speak in various different places. Is the adoption different in, in different regions of the world? You know, he, obviously here in the UK, in Ireland, in Europe, you know, I, I, I follow you and other people on Twitter. So I, you know, I see a reasonable amount of stuff that that's going on, but equally I'm aware of, there's a huge demand for this in 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 India, for example, or in, in in African countries as well. So I'm interested in your perspective of how it's been adopted in those those different regions. Yeah. So I mean, the really interesting thing is is I would think probably in the very early days, certainly based on my experience, that Europe was generally speaking an early adopter. Uh, like I say, the training courses started in 2011, so you know over a decade ago. And um, I think as the kind of as in inverted commas, as the movement has gained momentum over time, we certainly have seen that spread prolifically to the, you know, Asian region. Um, and, and there is one thing for me that's very, very interesting, because, you know, I've worked with different uh, companies and individuals, um, Pakistan, India, several in, in Africa, actually, as well. And the motivations there are the flip side of what happens here. So there, it is seen as a device, as it should be, which enables stories that otherwise would never be told. And I think the thing about it is, is that what are perceived here as barriers to entry because it's being compared to a huge big broadcast camera are non-existent in those environments because, in fact, they're often being used by startup or local news organizations who, you know, they don't have the same expectations of, of broadcast standard at all. I'm not saying the storytelling is not as good. I'm just saying they're not talking about bit rates and color space. That doesn't enter the conversation at all. Um, 
And I think that's a huge thing because that really is, that's the epitome of this concept of the democratization of new storytelling. We could we could learn a thing or two in that space, to be honest with you. We could do more to empower communities to be able to sell their stories. But I, again, <laughs> I'm starting to sound like a broken record. I have been saying this for a while. Um, so yeah, I think those areas, uh, I'm, see, we're, I'm we're basically seeing an explosion in adoption and also in the demand for journalism training. So like I've worked with the British NGO, the Thompson Foundation, for nearly a decade, and they have free online resources that exact market is their target. And you can see by the signups, like there are literally thousands upon thousands of journalism or aspiring journalists doing those courses to get the basic skills to know how to use their phone to be able to tell important and relevant, timely stories in their communities. And I think that's an amazing thing. Is it also fair to say that in, in the North American market, it's not really something that's taken off? I've spoken at events where individuals from the US television news market have been, let's say, skeptical with a capital S, uh, borderline ridiculing the speakers on the stage for suggesting that you can basically do professional television with phones. Now, that is going back a few years, to be fair. But nonetheless, I definitely think that, and I would predominantly put it down to how strictly unionized the actual organizations in the States mostly are, but definitely there's a few pioneer states I'd who've, been, who've been pushing the boundaries on this. Um, so it, it's starting to become a, a topic for discussion, but the ivory tower syndrome is alive and well stateside, um, in spite of the fact that some of the broadcasters are creaking at the seams with all technology and desperately need to look at how they plan for the future. You know, again, to name tech Philip one more time, he said a really, really interesting thing at the, at the end of his last presentation at MojoFest. He said, I am not saying that mobile is the best tool for television news production. What I am saying is that the television news audience is pivoting and changing their behaviors and their behaviors are no longer related to television news. They're still news junkies, but where they get their news is fundamentally changed. And what I am saying is that the mobile is the best tool for versatility to reach that audience. And I think that's in a nutshell. I think that's something that perhaps, perhaps some of the bigger brand states I'd need to really, really see the opportunity for. But I have to also say, I'm, I'm working at the moment with the CNN Academy here in Dublin, uh, training a host of 18 journalists, basically, to prepare them for their career in the media. And CNN, to be fair to them, uh, jumped on this idea of let's empower them for the future. Let's give them the skills. It's going to make them really versatile multimedia storytellers. So clearly, the conversation is happening, but the adoption may be lagging a little bit behind the, the EU. In some ways, you've, you've, you've sort of pre preempted my next question, because we've talked a lot about broadcast. And, and, and broadcast television. Whereas, you know, a lot of the people we speak to in the podcast, we've done broadcast, we've done broadcast for a very long time. What it's now about is about everything else. It is about TikTok, it's about Twitter, it's about YouTube, it's about all of the other platforms. And I'm guessing from what you've said before is that you see mobile as being absolutely intrinsic to how those kind of stories can be told on those kind of platforms. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I had a, I won't say an argument, but we had a testy exchange with the journalism student recently enough. And I sort of said, I want you to park all your preconceptions about what you think this phone's limitations are. Just push it all to one side. Let me ask you a question. If you order a product from Amazon, are you more fussed about the product that's in the box or the box that the actual item is delivered in? Because when it comes down to semantics, legacy wise, the television has been the box that delivers the message to you. But nowadays, it really is all about the integrity of what the product itself is. And the product is the story. So I would say that the, the really, really interesting thing in this space right now is as we, as we approach what I think is going to be another huge transformative uh, step with the adoption of AI uh, content and generative AI, um, I think the one USP that every news organization has that they have not fully capitalized on yet is integrity and trust. No one ever sits at home, or if they do, God bless them. But no one ever sits at home, watches a package on the six or nine o'clock news, turns to the partner or person sitting beside them and goes, I bet you that was shot on a PMW 500 camera. The day that happens, I will literally eat my hat. So, you know, the thing about it is, is that we, as the broadcast family, get terribly excited about the latest, biggest, shiniest, most expensive thing. But what we sometimes fail to realize is that the person in the audience really does not give a damn. They are trusting us above all else to give them facts. And in a time when we're about, I believe at least, to see an absolute tsunami of fake and mis and disinformation content generated by AI in the social space, the one thing that people are ultimately going to have to rely on is journalistic integrity and trust. So 
I really wish, as someone who's been in news for 20 years, I really wish we could move the narrative away from the gear and really start to focus on that idea of serving the audience the best way we can, wherever they can or wherever they are, and to try and basically reach into spaces that otherwise we really have failed to do, just purely by the way news organizations are generally built. You know, like the wheel means the demands are very much focused on a quite short term achievement thing. It would be great if we had sort of slightly broader, longer term strategies to reach new communities and be willing to share that content across platforms. Don't start me on TikTok. I'm too old. But nonetheless, it doesn't matter what platform it is. Just find where your audience is and reach out to them there. That would be my strategy anyway. So you talked about the CNN Academy and, and journalists coming into the industry. Are they still focused on that kind of broadcast mindset? Because that's you know, they're looking at a career in television or are they coming in much more with that sort of multimedia view that I can do this for whatever platform is necessary? That That's a phenomenal question because, you know, I, I certainly, before I started this particular course, I had the perception that, you know, digital natives, by virtue of the fact that they've grown up in a post-television time, in many cases, would completely see the opportunity for what mobile can bring to the party. And yet I have found myself on the defensive on several occasions trying to explain why if you get a job as a brand new journalist straight out of college in a news organization, I can promise you they will not be handing you a 60,000 euro camera anytime soon, if ever. So please stop this perception of in order to be credible, I need to have this huge big broadcast camera because the truth about it is that is, is likely to never actually happen. So what I've been trying to really position their thinking on in this is I've sat on interview panels for lots of journalism positions over the years, and I've actually said quite publicly that I am still, to this day, waiting to have my socks blown off by someone who literally comes into an interview, owns the room, slides an iPad or something across the table with a portfolio of immersive stories, long-form journalism, video, social, can show metrics and KPIs so they're clued into what are the measurements that matter these days, and literally leave me with my chin on the table. I don't care if you're only five years out of college. If you can give me that, you're right at the top of my pile of who the hell I want to move into the actual newsroom. And I think an awful lot of newsrooms are slowly starting to see that that's where the energy needs to go. I'm not saying that experience is not valuable. It is. But the truth about it is, is I personally would find someone who shows that level of awareness and I would also say hunger. I can easily put energy into making sure that, that their skill set as a journalist can be expanded over time through training. But that versatility is a huge USP. So you mentioned about, you know, the first courses back in 2010, 2011, so we're maybe a, a decade or so um, in at the moment. Crystal ball time then, Glenn, what's next? What do you think is the, the big developments, either in terms of technology or in terms of um, opportunities for how stories get told? So, um, you know, I've, I've watched uh, 360 degree content for probably pushing it to six, seven years at this stage. And if you were to ask me a couple of years ago about it, I would have thought this idea of being able to transport people to a new location and allow them to immerse themselves. And that is going to be huge. When I then start to see what Facebook or Meta um, are doing with the metaverse and how it's immediately been attempt, you know, the attempts turned into basically a massive marketing platform. I kind of now start to get chills down my spine and think oh, that's, that's pretty scary kind of stuff. So actually I flipped 180 degrees on that. I'm now kind of, I won't say anti-metaverse, but hugely skeptical of it. I still think, that and I've touched on it already, this idea of, of the power, the transformative power of AI for good or bad is what is going to basically define the next decade. And I honestly would say, uh, like I'm, I'm doing kind of research work on AI at the moment, and I'm finding new kind of middleware solutions on the market popping up like mushrooms every day, which are making me very, very, very twitchy. Um, this is why I say that I think news organizations right now, as we face into a time where content can be created probably tenfold, if not a hundredfold faster without journalistic integrity. I mean, you've, you've probably seen all the narratives about how ChatGPT can quite convincingly basically give you fake or false information and then defend it quite aggressively. Um, I think there's a new Rubicon being crossed. And I think the key thing about it is, is that we need to reinforce this idea of accountability, trust, and veracity above all else, um, because AI definitely, everything I've seen so far is is scaring the life out of me. I have four kids, all under or up to the age of 10, Craig, and I tell you, I, I'm nervous about what they're going to be facing into when they hit their 20s. That's, that's the truth. That probably then answers the next question, which is the question I ask everyone, which is, what is it, if anything, that keeps you up at night? Yeah, uh, disinformation, malicious disinformation, um, and, and I'll give you a context for that comment, because 
I, uh, I remember speaking at a conference in Kuwait, best part of five, six years ago, it must have been. It wasn't too long before the previous US election anyway. And uh, I, I had just found out about the whole Cambridge Analytica story and the psychological profiling that they were using at tech, whatever. And I remember thinking, you can see how this paves the way for what will come. And now you pair that idea of psych profiling people from readily available data sources that are on the internet already with the ability of AI to generate per personalized responses and content. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling kind of like retreating to the woods and, you know, living in a tent for a while might be a really good solution, to be honest with you, because I think what's coming is very, very scary. Now, in, in their defense, uh, Adobe, again, spoke at MojoFest in May about their content authenticity initiative. I think that is, it for me, that is probably the single most important kind of step forward for news organizations that we onboard and get into this idea of having a traceable token through the actual entire media lifetime so we can prove when stuff is tampered with or fake. Um, everything rides on it. A somber thought to end on from Glenn there, emphasizing, I guess, the critical role which trusted news organizations play in the health of our society and why press freedoms are so important. What do you think about this or any of what we discussed? Let us know. You can get in touch via social. I am Craig AW1969 on both Twitter and Instagram, or you can follow any of the various Avid social channels, or you can email us. We are making the media at avid.com. Now, Glenn talked about content authenticity, and if you check out the show notes, you can find a link to an episode on the work of Project Origin, which is striving to provide a technical solution to just this issue. You can also find there a link to a recent set of reports from the DPP on the future of news. Now, make sure to subscribe to find out when new episodes of the podcast are released, like, share, and leave a review too. Many thanks to Glenn for joining us for this episode. Thanks to our producer, Matt Diggs. To you, many thanks for listening once more. That's all from me, Craig Wilson, for this episode. Join me next time for more of the people making the media. Hold up. 